All right, everybody, let's get started. Hello, folks. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It is good to be with you for another edition of our regularly scheduled program. The Lunchtime Discovery Series is brought to you by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality and us here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and hosted by yours truly, Chris Smith. I'm the curator for current science programs. And uh, yeah, it's good to be here. Every week we get to meet interesting people, uh, our guest speakers, and meet all of you who are tuned in and watching on YouTube. Uh, and we get to learn interesting things about what's going on out there in the world around science, nature, conservation, education, and more. Uh, we always have great conversations, and it's always a good time. These programs always leave me uh, energized, educated, filled up, ready to go for the rest of the week with new knowledge and new information. Uh, and I hope you all feel that same way, too, after this program. It's great to see everybody down here in the chat who are tuning in. Know that this program is interactive. So as we go throughout today's presentation, if a question pops up for you, go ahead and type it into the chat have those lined up, queued up, ready for me. After our presentation from our guest speaker, I'll be looking to you for your thoughts, questions, and comments to bring over into the live stream and ask our guest, and hopefully we can get a nice, good conversation going. Which, I should say, uh, for today's topic, fungus, we've kind of been doing the fungus game now for a little while here at the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Last Wednesday, we had a presentation about mushroom hunting, foraging, and mushroom identification. Talked a little bit about fungus, of course. And then on Saturday, here at the museum, it was an entire day devoted to fungus as part of our Darwin Days celebration. And now today, we've just been having so much fun, we're gonna keep the party going with today's special guest. Everybody, I would like for you to meet our guest now, uh, Dr. Jose Vargas Muniz. Dr. Vargas Muniz is a biology professor, assistant professor of biology at Southern Illinois University, and joins me now. Hi, Jose. Hi, Chris. And thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm really excited to be part of this program. And also, I want to thank the organizing for inviting me, as well as the member of the audience for being interested in learning more about something that is really dear to my heart, that is like fungal biology. So my name is Jose, my pronouns are he, his, and him. And at Southern Illinois, my research program is trying to utilize cell biology to understand fungal pathogen and find ways to like prevent this infection and trying to treat them as well. So um, we're thinking about fungi, we usually think about them about as microbe and being part of the microbiology program. We of course, when I practice everything work, I'm gonna try to do it live, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> um, so when we were thinking about microbes, um, they're highly diverse. We can find it everywhere in the environment. And every place in air that you can think about it, they're probably colonized by this little uh, living organism. So when you're thinking about microbial diversity, as you would expect with like flora and fauna being highly diverse in the tropics, this is the same with microbes. What is something that is also surprising is that places that you would think that are challenging or barren of life diversity, like desert, actually can see high diversity of micro living in that area that can arrival on the tropics. But, so these are organisms that are really hardy and can colonize and be diverse in different environments. We can see microbial community also being found in rock and deep into rock crevices. So they can create ecological niche in different areas. And you can go to your garden and take a certain amount of soil. And in this case, we, or the group that had this image is stained it with a dye called DAPI that basically binds to DNA. And when you shine UV radiation or UV light, you will start seeing that blue coming off. And from this soil sample, you can see all that purple, blue, haze, those are basically nucleic acid or DNA from all the microbes that are living in the soil. So for fungi, when we're thinking about them and how diverse they are, 
we estimate conservatively that there are about 1.5 million fungal species. However, this conservative estimate doesn't take into account new habitat recognition and the molecular approaches that we can basically identify fungi by looking for DNA signature. So taking into this account, there is predicted to be about 2.2 to 3.8 million fungal species, which means that at best, we have only described 8% of the fungal species. Phylogenetics, which is basically is like analyzing the whole genome of the fungi and putting it into perspective with relationship with each other, also further increases estimates. So it can be high up to like 12 million species of fungi that are out there that we haven't even a study or characterized. Sadly, many environments and countries have been neglected for being surveyed. So when we are trying to do survey as a field of science, we find that 90% of the specimen collected for these neglected environments and area are undescribed species. So there is a lot of potential in this field to like discover new species by going out there and trying to isolate this fungus. There is also a significant number of what is colloquially known as dark matter fungi. So there are mostly fungi that belong to the early diverging fungi, so fairly simplistic, uh, morphologically in shape. So these fungi are a little bit more tricky to isolate, and that has become a challenge to be able to like get them into per culture and be able to describe. So they're highly diverse and they are, have different relationships with different organisms. So when we're thinking about the current tree of life, we know that this prokaryotic group called archaea and us eukaryotes that have a nuclei that envelop our nucleic material, um, our sister group and they have common ancestors. This is evident by different molecular um, components like the same RNA polymerase that synthesize the mRNA or using different components to initiate the production of mRNA out of DNA. So here's an oversimplified tree of life. So here's the bacteria. So it will be all those bacteria that you would normally hear in the news whenever there is like a food poisoning outbreak with salmonella or with E. coli. Then we have the archaea that they're still prokaryotes. So they look kind of like bacteria when you're looking at by eye, but when you look at the DNA and the molecular component, they actually more closely resemble eukaryotes. And then we have all eukaryotes that are all these organisms that have organelle surrounding by membrane with the nuclei that we usually see in textbook. So generally speaking, we believe that eukaryotes and prokaryotes diverged about 2 billion years ago. And they implant fungi and animals that are these multicellular organisms that are eukaryotes are believed to have diverged from each other around 1 billion ago. So as I mentioned, fungi are eukaryotes. So this is where they sit on the tree of life. So what is fungus? So back in the middle of the 20th century, when scientists were trying to like classify life, they decided to classify based on the mode of nutrition. So animal, like us, we engulf our food. So we basically eat it and have a special sac to digest it, like the stomach. Then you have the plants that are the one that basically photosynthesize, they produce their own food. And then we have fungi, which secrete enzyme and other chemical to break down the nutrients outside of the cell, and then they will basically reabsorb it. So when biologists were trying to understand more and more of these different organisms, they also made other distinction. For example, when we are looking at the cell membrane, we animals use cholesterol to provide um, function to our membrane while fungi use a different molecule called ergosterol. And when we're looking at the cell wall, both plant cells and fungal cells have this structure However, the plant cell wall is made of cellulose, while fungal cell wall is made of two different compounds called chitin and beta-glucans. What is really interesting is that even though these three groups, animal, plant, and fungi, are multicellular, so they are basically organisms that have more than one cell, 
the way that they evolve this complex trait are actually not conserved. So they evolve multicellularly independent from each other. So, and basically that gave us an idea that this is something that is convergent evolution. So it's like basically they solving the same problem that multicellularity provide, but using different approaches. Even though that they're microorganisms, they actually can form really complex structure. So here we have images of reproductive structure of fungi, which normally traditional mycologists would use to identify different species because of the complexity and the specific ways that they assemble this area. So here, what we are observing, for example, in the image that I'm highlighting with my visual pointer is the spore productive structure or aspergillus. And these little dots in here are the spores that they are producing. So they have this different structure that they can produce to disperse um, spores or carry out different function. They also come in different color. So they are really colorful and charismatic when you're like growing them in agar. And they also can have multiple color even on the same isolate. So in here we have a strain of horsia wernickia that you can see that is heavily pigmented in with melanin, which is a pigment that gives a color black to this G cell. But they also have a different kind of melanin that gives them that greenish olive color. So they can change their coloration depending on the environment. Now, we know that fungi are really important for the environment. They quite literally help shape the soil. So when we mentioned before, fungi produce this enzyme that they release into the environment to be able to like digest their compounds and be able to bring it. So those enzymes and compounds that they release can alter the chemistry of the soil, making things that might not be accessible to other organisms become more accessible and helping shape what nutrients are available in the soil. And you can take soil and you can see that fungi are quite literally holding the soil together. So it's also giving some mechanical structure to the soil just by growing in these filamentous threads that we call hyphae. And when they are digesting and changing the chemistry, depending on what inorganic compounds are compounds or molecules that don't have carbon molecules, they can also form crystal and their hyphae can serve as an area for this crystal to basically polymerize and crystallize and become bigger. So soil, soil is not the end of the role in the environment of fungi. We probably recognize fungi as one of the key decomposer in the environment. So you are going to a trek um, walking around the different trails in North Carolina you probably can see that there is this reproductive structure of fungi where the actual cells are inside of the wood, um, degrading it and digesting the complex polymers that are in the wood. As we mentioned, they also are really important for connecting the soil and carrying out those um, interaction. And most of our knowledge of fungi come from ecological environments that are terrestrial. So we're thinking about them in forests, in the desert, but they are also really important in aquatic and marine system. So in here, we have an example how they facilitate the cycle of nutrients. So usually in the marine or aquatic environment, you have these large algae that are not accessible for little animals that are part of the soil plankton. But fungi can parasitize these large algae and digest and extract nutrients for them. And when they release spores to complete their cycle, now those spores carry out the nutrients for the algae and can be consumed by the soil plankton, making these carbons and nitrogen and different nutrients accessible to the soil plankton that otherwise will be sequestered and not bioavailable. They also have really important role in economy and medicine. When we were thinking about agriculture, if you like ice cream like me, 
you have a fungus to um, tank. Basically, the cow in here, they fall symbiosis to fungi, with fungi. And when the cow is eating grass and eating different vegetable components, they themselves don't have the enzyme to break it down. So when the um, vegetables and plant materials are reaching the um, cow digestive system, the first thing that breaks down those hard components are fungi. And then the cows can basically benefit from that. One of the best characterized fungal symbiosis also come from plants. So they form this relationship that are known as mycorrhizae, which allow the fungi to get carbon from the plant, but the plant benefit from the fungi gathering different nutrients and providing it to the plant. So this allow the plant to go faster, more robustly. It also made the plant more resilient to different environmental condition. So we benefit greatly for this relationship because it makes our crop more productive. They also really important for fermentation. I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I feel like I'm 90% pan -sobao. And this is possible due to the fermentation of baker's yeast. They also give really characteristic flavor and aroma profile to cheese, in particular to the blue cheese, because this kind of like greenish look thing that is in the cheese, actually fungus that is growing and fermenting the cheese and producing those organic compounds that we detect as different flavor and different odors from the cheese. Also, they are used for fermentation of different products. In here, we have a sample of soy sauce. So traditionally brewed soy sauce rely on a filamentous fungus to ferment the soybeans to produce um, this compound. And it can enrich the flavor profile of the soy sauce when they are traditionally brewed. And probably one of the classical examples of a mistake gone well is the use of, or the discovery of antibiotic when we, when um, there was this discovery in which one of the plate got contaminated with a fungus and the scientists noted that there was a halo inhibition and that basically led to the discovery of penicillin, which led to revolutionize the way that we treat bacterial infection, significantly impacting the quality of life of uh, people because we didn't have to worry anymore or be as afraid as we used to be of bacterial infection. So there is this quote from Dr. Willis that really resonate with me. And it's like when we are looking for nature-based solution to some of our more critical global challenges, fungi can provide many of the answers. So here we have been talking a little bit about how they contribute to the economy. But there is a lot of interest of using fungi for biotechnology purposes, for synthesizing medicine, for producing full alternate food alternatives like meat replacement, or using fungi for producing flour, to also using fungal tissue to produce and reduce the amount or reliance of using animal for leather. So it seems that there is a lot of great solution that we can use if we understand fungi better. Sadly, as you probably get it for the title of my talk, fungi also have a dark side to them. And it's that they can cause devastating infection. So here we have a sample of banana brassica toga, which is a fungal infection of the banana leaf that reduces the viability and the, um, how productive the banana trees are. If you ever wonder why banana candy doesn't taste like bananas, you actually have a fungus to blame. So that will be fusarian, which can infect banana tree and can decimate the culture of these plants. And before we have a zero cultivar, which is basically kind of like a subspecies of banana, that was the predominant one. And then the fusarian strain basically drove them to extinction. So the banana candy that we had is actually taste like that initial cultivar that went extinct because of fusarian infection. Now we are experiencing a second wave of this disease, which is draining the current um, cultivar that we are using for banana for extinction. So right now we have the possible attainable yield with our current crop 
and we still lose a significant amount of those crops to weed, pathogen, viruses, and pests. So these infections are becoming a little are becoming troublesome if we want to like be able to feed the growing human population we are having an increasing footprint and invading more and more wild ecosystem so when we're thinking about plant fungal pathogen we usually think about the disease triangle and we would need the susceptible host and pathogen which basically is in the environment but then we also think about favorable environment for infection. And now we are in the stage of climate crisis in which the warmer temperature is actually creating more favorable environment for the fungi to colonize and threaten our food supply. Plants are not the only ones that are decimated by fungal infection. So there are fungal animal pathogen. In here, we have a sample coral infection in the Caribbean right now, there's outbreak of Aspergillus CW infection of coral fans. There's also severe infection of amphibians that are turning to like drive this species of amphibian to extinction. And similarly, there are infection of mammals like the white nose syndrome in bats that usually infect hibernating bats. And this is something that are significantly reducing the number of species or individuals or hibernating bats in the mainland U.S. And we're not as set, as set from this. Humans also can get infected by fungi and can cause severe debilitating disease. And fungal infections are becoming more difficult to treat. And for this reason, the CDC has issued guidelines for three major fungal human pathogens. So one of these will be Candida auris, that is thought to be one of the first um, fungal pathogens that are emerging due to the climate crisis and is becoming really predominant. People have been seeing these fungus in multiple environments, particularly nursing homes and areas when there are susceptible population. And what is remarkable and frightening of this pathogen is that it can resist all the available antifungal that we had to treat fungal infection. So this is an image of the reported cases up to like 2019. And we have few states that have reported candida um, iris infection. And now they just updated for 2022. And what we're seeing is that there is a significant expansion of the pathogen abundance in geolog geographical distribution. Something that I want to know is that even though that the light yellow indicates area that haven't been detected, this cannot be a case of like it is not detected because we are not actually looking for it. So all the states that are in light yellow has in common is that people are not screening for this pathogen. So there is another more common gist um, pathogen that is candida albicans, so it's usually associated with gist infection and thrush. And even though that we have a lot of available drug to treat it, we also seen like there's a remarkable increase in drug resistance from this pathogen. And this is not exclusive to yeast fungi. There's also filamental fungi or molds are, are becoming more resistant, which is a little bit frightening because we have fairly limited drugs to be able to treat it. So normally we use this acyl drug that usually target the synthesis or glycerol. So basically target the plasma membrane of the fungus to kill it. And now the fungus is becoming more resistant. Something that is really curious about fungal pathogens is that they're not primary human pathogen. They actually are from other origin and somehow has the right tool to colonize and infect humans. So candida auris is usually found in hypersarine environments. So then candida albicans tends to be a human commensal. So probably about 70 to 80% of us are colonized by Candida albicans. They tend to be a um, partner and symbiote of us except when conditions go awry and it causes infection. And then Aspergillus fumigatus is usually found on compost pile. This increase of drug resistance is also becoming a little bit more alarming because the fungal infection is also becoming more common. So in parentheses, you would note the numbers in 2012. And for example, for invasive aspergillosis, there were about 200,000 cases per year. 
now in 2022, it's up to 300,000. So they have been like a significant increase in the number of patients that are infected. And this is a little bit also concerning because mortality rate is between 30 to 90%. And one of the factors that is contributing this is that the climate crisis is impacting the geographical location where the fungal infections are. So here we have a sample of valley fever. So this is the area where valley fever is like thought to be endemic in purple. And current mathematical modeling, what I'm expecting is like this geographical range is going to start expanding due to desertification as well as increasing warmer temperature. So as time goes by, there is going to be more geographical region. And by two, uh, 2090, we expect to almost half of the United Continental um, U.S. to like be an uh, area when this fungal disease is actually endemic. The camel crisis will impact a lot of different attributes that are associated with fungal pathogens. So it will impact deodorants. As we mentioned, the geographical range, it can also help the dispersal. In the case of plant pathogen, it can make the host also more susceptible. And we are expecting to see the emergence of multiple fungi that would normally be thought as environmental fungi, but then making the jump into becoming fungal pathogen. So my lab is really interested in trying to like get there and have an understanding how a fungus that is usually in the environment become pathogenic. So we are basically ahead of this race. And the environment that we are really interested in is the marine environment. So normally you would think about it to be a place that you can relax and go on a vacation, but this is a really um, stream environment for fungi. So they had to receive the changes in the concentration of salt. They're constantly exposed to UV without sunblock to protect them. And they had to evolve unique biology to adapt to this environment. We know that fungi are everywhere in the marine environment. So we have seen signature of fungal um, being metabolic active and being growing and thriving in places that you would not normally talk that fungi are like the hydrothermal vent. They also perform saprotrophic role, uh, role in the marine environment. And similar to the land counterpart, they also follow uh, marine plants and form important symbiosis with them. So when I was at postal at UNC Chapel Hill with Amy Gladfelder, we thought that the challenges of the marine environment was to live for really unique biology. And we already knew this, based on images from marine fungi and their spores, which usually don't look fairly similar to those of the terrestrial counterpart. So they have different appendages that will allow them to bind to their substrate or help them disperse in the marine and environment. So when we were doing that, we were really interested in looking at the cell biology and how they grow. And we found this remarkable fungus that basically grow both in two different ways. So we have here bottinges, which basically go um, from one area, it starts inflating like it is a balloon until it reaches a, a size and then basically split. Then we have fissionges, which basically grow and then divide in the middle to create two new cells. And then we got this horse where Nikia that actually have both. So it divides in the middle, similar to like fission yeast. And then once it formed that middle division point, you start budding from the pole. So it was really interesting for us because why a fungus would have two different methods of division to achieve the same goal. So now working in my independent lab, we uh on the grad students, Stephanie and Tony, we actually decided to try to see how the environment impact the shape of the fungus. So we started growing it in just like a normal, regular media that we normally grow yeast in. And what we see is that they grow a little bit more filamento-ish, so it doesn't look truly filamentous. But when we add 0.6 molar of sodium chloride or like table salt, which is kind of like similar to the concentration in the marine environment, they start doing that characteristic divide in the middle and then but for the pole. 
and we can increase the salt concentration to 1.7. So this is probably more similar to hypersaline salterns. And we see that they maintain that yeast-like morphology. So we got really curious because we know that Horsia wernickia can also cause infection on humans and cause this disease known as tinea negra. And we wanted to see like, oh, so what happened with different isolate? How we can get isolated from the soil, from the clinic, and from the marine environment, how those different environments shape the morphology of this yeast. And what we notice is that you can get different environment and you get a great diversity of the fungal cell shape. So predominantly you see this gist morphology, but what is really interesting to us is that when we look at the clinical one, we see that there is more true hyphae or true filamentation happening. So we got really interested in like trying to use this as a model to understand how these normally environmental organisms that live in stream environment can evolve into becoming a human pathogen. So to start testing this, um, Stephanie and I developed a Galeria Meronella model. So it's like basically this little cute carpeter that what you can do is that you can inject the G cells in there and then see how well it survives. So what we were expecting to see is like environmental fungi, they will not cause severe infection and the clinical one will cause severe infection. To our surprise, we actually saw that that wasn't the case and some of the more virulent ones were actually coming from the marine environment. So these environmental isolates that live in the ocean were capable of colonizing and killing these little larvae better than even the clinical ones that were iso isolated from patients. So this indicated us that there's this potential for these environmental isolates to like easily jump and become pathogenic in the conditions are right. So now with that knowledge, what we're trying to do is like basically have a better understanding how they become pathogenic. What are the tools that they have that allow them to colonize human? So Horsia Wernickia is quite interesting in the sense that it can exist as a haploid, which means it has only one copy of their genome or each one of the genes. But it can basically create this like fusion event to create what is known as an intraspecific hybrid. And that adds to diversity into the genome. So what we're expecting to do now that we're trying to like better understand this is that we will have a Horsia isolate and we can compare it to a different isolate that can cause disease. And what we expect to see is that they're regulating the genes in different ways. So that way we'll basically give them some ability to be able to colonize the host and be able to survive higher temperature and cause disease. We can put into this larvae and then see how these like different genes can impact the virulence of the uh, galeria. So that way we can get to a better understanding. It's like, oh, these are the cards that the fungus has to play to be able to colonize a human host and cause severe disease. So this is really exciting, but we are also really interested. It's like, okay, we have a fungus that became went from environmental to a pathogen. It actually broke bad, and we are trying to like basically treat it. How we improve our way of like treating these organisms? And for that, my lab used this small Colaspergillus fumigatus. So we are really interested in it because infection with this fungus in the rice, and it also has a really hefty mortality rate but it also has a significant economic impact. So the US alone is paying over 600 million on treating invasive aspergillosis and treatment per patient can cost up to $100,000. So these are highly cost, uh, costly and really long treatment. So my lab is trying to understand the fungal um, cell biology to address this. And one of the things that we are really interested in is morphogenesis. So it's the ability of the fungus to regulate its shape because we know that it's really important for fungal pathogenesis. For example, going back to Candida albicans, it is known as a polymorphic uh, fungus, which basically means it can assume multiple shapes. And they can grow as a yeast, which can easily disperse inside of the host's body. 
they also form these subtle hyphae that are helpful for biofilm formation and basically um, mediating transitions. And they also form hyphae, which are those thread um, structures that are really important for invading the host tissue. So if you lock candida albica either as a cheese or as a hyphae, this fungal pathogen cannot cause significant disease anymore. Although it's not as drastically severe as in Candida albicans, there's another fungal pathogen called Cryptococcus neoformans that also goes these uh, morphological changes in which the G cell is thought to be really important for dissemination, like persisting is uh, causing disease, while the Titan cells, which are these like massive cells that are way bigger than the humans' um, immune cells, are thought to be help being damper the immune system as well as avoiding being eaten up by those immune cells. Aspergillus fumigatus also goes really drastic morphological transition as it grow. So it basically starts as a resin spore that start growing in all ends. So again, like basically growing like a inflating balloon and they, they establish polarity, which basically they say like, we're gonna grow in one side and one side only. And they start forming this germ to they deform this structure right here that is called a septum. And that's when true multicellular stage of growth happen. So Easpagil is actually in the environment, like in the compost pile, then some of these hyphae would differentiate into this structure known as a conidiophore. So they would basically change morphology to be able to disseminate more spores. And what we know is that the fungal cell wall is really important for maintaining the cell shape. So it's this really um, dynamic structure that allow the fungi to maintain their shape in particular because fungal cells are highly pressurized. So knowing that this structure is really important for cell shape and cell viability and mammalian systems like us don't have cell wall, a lot of drugs have been developed to target the cell wall. One of these drugs is caspofungin which is usually used when the primary treatment fail. And sadly, this drug is actually what is not as fungal static. So it stops the fungal from growing, but it doesn't actually um, kill the fungus, which is kind of like a little bit troublesome because usually as pegelos infect immunocompromised patients or patients that don't have immune system to remove the fungus. So my life is really interesting looking for genes that can basically make caspofungin work better. So we actually are studying this family of genes that have generic mutants that lack that gene. And we found that actually they become more susceptible to caspofungin. So here we have a plate of the normal um, wild type fungus. And we have these little strips that are called a strip. So basically if you go here at the top, they are saturated with the drug. And then as you go, further into the strip, they basically get more and more diluted due to diffusion. So you can see how susceptible drugs are or the fungus are to a specific drug. So in one type, what we can see is that they're still decently can grow even close to it. But then when you had this mutant we call Delta SV, we see that there's a lot of more like clearing of the fungus. So you can basically see the play and you can see across of the prey well seeing that fungal burn uh, loan. And we actually take a zoom in into that region. You can actually see that in the wild type, it's like fully covered like the plate. So you kind of like see too much of the media that are sustaining the fungus. But you look at the mutant, you see that basically there's still a lot of empty space. So my grad student Rebecca was really interested in trying to understand this is uh, because they, um, this mutant arrest in a really early stage and that's why we don't see it or is actually killing it. So the way that we can do this is that we can grow the fungus and we can grow it in the presence of the drug. And then we can grow the mutant and we can basically create what is known as a complemented strain. So we had the mutant and we put the gene back into it and we use this dye that basically what it does is like if the fungus is alive, it will metabolize the dye and the dye will basically grow green. And when we do that with the wild type, what we see is like even though that we see that the mycelia is a little bit stunted, we still see that there's a lot of green staining indicating that there is growth inhibition, but the fungus is still alive. 
However, when we do the stain with our mutant, we see that there's very little stain indicating that the fungus is actually dead. And then we can put the gene back and we recapitulate the phenotype or the viability that we observe in the wild type. So we have quantified this with multiple genes of the same family. And what we see is that there is one that is a specific um, drop into the viability, which is really interesting. Then my grad student, she wanted to know how fast this drug at. So we can use another compound to trying to access how damaged the cell wall is after two hours of treatment. And what we observe is that if, you, if we grow the fungus in normal um, condition, we don't see any staining. So we don't see any magenta like staining the hyphae. However, if we have our mutants and we treat it with caspofungin, we start seeing that there's a significant strain, uh, staining indicating that our mutant is not capable of responding to this drug, which is probably why it ended up becoming um, the causing death in the fungus. So this is great, but this is all done in a Petri dish. So we're really interested in like, trying to figure out if this actually can work in vivo. So we use a mouse model. And what we do is that we basically immunosuppress the mice um, using a drug called cyclophosphamide and another drug called triamcinolone. So basically we're mimicking the immune status of patients that come down with aspergillus. And then on day zero, we infect them with a the fungus. Then we give them treatment with caspofungin from day one to day four. We also use a sham, which basically is just all on saline, just to as a control. And what we observe is that there is a clear protective phenotype. So in here we have both the um, complement strain, which is has the gene put back, and the wild type. And we see that even with treatment, we have about um, 70 to 90% mortality happening at day 14. However, when we combine the mutant with caspofungi, we see that actually there's only like 30%. So using this bold um, approach it's like to target not just the gene, but also with caspofungi, we see that there's a better survival and we improve the outcome of treating with caspofungi. We also really interested in drug resistance to basically get ahead of the game from the fungus. And because we noticed that the mutant is so susceptible to the drug, it will help us screen for spontaneous uh, resistant clones. And doing this um, essay, my grad student actually found that there were a couple of colonies that they were growing better. So there's this question whether it's like tolerance or it is actually resistant. So my grad student, she took those colony and passed it. And what she found out is that it's actually resistant. So we were able to isolate uh, fungus that will be able to like resist the drug better. So here we have our colony of the wild type, the mutant and the complement, and we still see the viability. And we were able to get two isolates that were resistant to the drug. And to our surprise, one of them actually goes back to the wild type stage. So now we were trying to like better understand how fungi evolve resistant to the drug as well as how we can use this drug in combination to the older mutant to improve patient treatment. And if there's anything that I would like you to like go away with the, from this talk is that I truly believe that deepening our knowledge of fungal cell biology will help us lead to improve treatment of fungal infection especially in on the consideration with the climate change and the change in you know, the environment will lead to a higher incidence of fungal infection and the development of more um, drug resistant fungi. And with that, I wanna thank my lab. So in particular, Stephanie and Tony, she worked with the marine fungi and helped us establish that model in the lab. And then I wanna also thank Rebecca Bush and Carson Dotty that are the one that work with the Casper fungi and the drug treatment. Also my collaborator for the Horsham Winnikia project, Dr. Amy Glafelter, Dr. Christine Field, and Lorna Michigan Field for helping us um, with this project. And obviously I have to thank my funding because they allow us to do cool science 
and follow our interests. So I'm extremely grateful for the Illinois taxpayer and the SIU system for um, providing startup funds for launching my lab. Rebecca is supported through a graduate student fellowship. And I was fortunate enough to get a summer fellowship, a Whitman fellowship with the MBO that was supported by the LNA Colwyn Summer Research Fellowship. And we recently also got a Bat for the Future grant to help us understand how the white nose syndrome fungus colonize the host. And with that, I will welcome any question. If you have any question later on that you wanted to follow up, feel free to email me or contact me via, via Twitter. So I'm always happy to help out. And with that, I will welcome Chris again. Fantastic stuff. Thank you, Dr. Vargas Munoz. Incredible. Right. Uh, I'm trying to think about the this uh, this connection between some of the fungus that you're working with and the drug, the caspofungin. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And so you yep. were okay. I'm I'm trying to I'm gonna talk this through. Make sure I understand it right. So uh, mm -hmm. you've got the wild type of the fungus, mm -hmm. and then you essentially grew a mutant version of the fungus mm -hmm. and then wanted to see how the mutants would react with the drug. Yeah. And the, the mutants and the drug could take out more of the mutant fungus. Yeah. So that helps you learn a little bit more about how this fungus interacts overall mm -hmm. with the drug, or I guess like, um, this isn't like a clinical trial necessarily. So how do you get the mutant fungus out there to improve the survivability? So for the mutant is like basically trying to like identify like possible drug targets. So you can use genetic tools and you delete that gene and then see how it behaves. So it will give you an idea of like, oh, this is a good target to basically develop like a combinational therapy. Um, right now, there is only one inhibitor that we know that can inhibit those um, genes. Um, the only problem is that we also have those genes and the inhibitor is non-selective. So if we inhibit our version of that gene that are also essential and inhibit the fungus. So now that we know that it will be like a good target for combinational treatment, we can partner with our organic chemists and trying to synthesize analogs of the drug to be able to like um, impact only the fungal version of that gene, we are like severely impacting the human ones. So it's kind of like basically at this stage, kind of like a proof of principle to trying to say like, oh, this is worthwhile to like follow up. And then later on will be the heavy lifting with the chemistry and trying to like figure out how we can inhibit it. We are actually ending up killing the patient while killing the fungus. <laughs> right. Wow. Fascinating stuff. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I don't yeah. know where I'm like, that was the key that I needed right there yeah. to unlock it, uh, at least for my brain. The folks tuning in, they seem to have got it on the first pass. So uh, <laughs> everybody, there are people in the chat who are dropping their appreciation for you uh, and yeah. saying lovely things like your research is amazing. Oh, I agree. Thank you all. And quite important. Uh, I think maybe I saw some of those headlines about Candida Aris. But it looks like we're with changing climates and mm -hmm. uh, the ways that we interact with nature changing. Mm -hmm. uh, these things are, we need to be paying attention to them a lot more than maybe we have been. It's good to know there's smart people like yeah. you thinking about it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, we changing climate is becoming a little bit challenging. Um, when Candida Aris was coming out in the news, um, Arturo Casalval, he's in John Hawking. He hypothesized that based on the profile and the multi-drug resistance, it probably came from a hypersaline environment. So this was a case that we saw in the clinic before we found it in the environment. And he was right. They found it in like salt marshes and in particular, those that were more severely impacted by climate change. And Portia Wernigia, for example, is come from that marine environment. And right now has been a little bit of troublesome to get genetics working on it. So we can do the same type of experiment that we did with Aspergillus. And it's because it's resistant to all the drugs that we have tried. So 
um the only drug that seems to work with it is like azoles and you probably don't want to use that as a marker because it's also the only way that we can treat the infection so these environmental fungi especially the stremophiles are significant concern for the environment and for patients as well okay very interesting stuff so let me get uh, some of these questions that have come for you or that are for you from the chat uh, and folks we've got several minutes so go ahead and type up more questions if you have them uh, the first one comes from cindy how are fungal infections commonly spread from human to human huh. that's a very good question so fungal infections tend to be the interesting thing that we are the end host or we basically don't allow the cycle to complete. So we are not intended to harbor those fungal infections. So usually you have very little human to human interaction or infection. So in the case of aspergillus, you usually get it when you're doing like gardening or something like that. Um, Cryptococcus neoformans is usually in the environment from like pigeon poop or stuff like that. Um, most of the ones that you will get for like human to human will be like dermatophyte fungus. So basically superficial infections that are on your skin. And those can come from like close contact or coming from like basically poor hygiene in case that you're not changing your socks often. So it is a little bit, but traditionally that at least the more severe infections, they tend to be more environmentally acquired that acquire through human-to-human uh, -human con uh, contact. All right, there you go, Cindy. All right, Michael wants to know, has anyone studied the use of sulfur-based compounds that are found in plants of the garlic family to treat patients with the fungi? Hmm. That's a very good question. Um, I don't know but you feel free to email me i can follow up um on the top of my head i know that a lot of the there's a lot of interest in like natural products um jason hernandez for example she works at florida gulf coast university she's looking at a lot of different essential oils from plant to see if actually inhibit fungal growth and she has a couple of really cool candidates that seem to be really good at killing the fungus Garlic is specific and the sulfur compound, I honestly don't know. But there's a lot of interest like looking into plant or uh, natural occurring compounds to inhibit fungal growth. Excellent, excellent stuff. Thanks, Michael. Uh, right, let's see. Uh, are there any ways we can protect ourselves from environmental fungal infections while still enjoying the outdoors and other activities that may put us at risk? Mm -hmm. So. The good thing and bad thing about environmental fungi that infects us is that usually they tend to infect immunocompromised patients. So if you have a healthy immune system, you don't have to worry. And this is probably going to scare you a little bit, but don't get scared. Uh, usually when you're walking on nature, you will probably hear somewhere between like 100 to 1,000 of aspergillus spores. But our immune system is well trained in getting rid of those spores. However, when you become immunocompromised, you know, then you basically change the story. So you have to be a little bit more careful. So this will be patients that are undergoing cancer therapies or are going to have solid organ transplant. And in that case, probably your doctor is going to tell you to be careful, mindful, watch a different hygiene routine. Usually if you have like a mask, like an N95 or something like that, it will be really protective because that way you will not be able to inhale the spores. But as long as you're immunocompetent, you sh there is not really a significant threat from environmental fungi. Yeah, like you said, good to know and bad to know. Yep. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. Uh, thank you so much for being on the program today. Oh, thank you all for inviting me and thank you to the audience for listening. And hopefully you got something cool about fungi. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Uh, looking at the folks in the chat, I, I think, yeah, we're definitely walking away with some new knowledge about, about fungi. Maybe some slightly scary knowledge 
Yep. But knowledge <laughs> is good in that way. Yeah. Uh, and more importantly, it's it's been fantastic to hear about your work and what you're doing to try to help. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Also, I think cool to get you back on this program uh, and at least virtually get you back into North Carolina since yeah. you mentioned doing your postdoc at UNC and before the show you had uh, reminded us that you did your uh, PhD work at Duke University. So it yep. was great to have you back in the state, even virtually. Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to give back to a state that gave so much back to me. I, will, I think we'll have to uh, we'll have to follow up with you again in the near future and see how things are going. Yeah, that's great. All right, uh, let's see. Oh, you know what? I've got I got a few seconds left. Ashlyn really wants to know how to identify a fungus that's growing on their bonsai tree's soil. Any tips? Oh, so usually it's really hard to unless they have like really characteristic symptoms um, you can identify. If you have a smartphone, there is this app called uh, iNaturalist and also Seek that you can take photos. And usually people are really good at looking at the symptoms and like coming up with like a diagnostic and tell you what might be growing in there. Um, more sophisticated way will basically grow the fungus and trying to see under the microscope to see reproductive structure and give you an idea. Um, or molecular approach of your sequence in the DNA. But my best bet is like trying to stamp a photo, see the um uh, the uh, the mushroom is a mushroom or the disease presentation. So people that are in the iNaturalist community can let you know. And, and the good thing is in North Carolina, there's a really good uh, microfile community. So usually you can get it down to the species name by just putting it in there. There you go, Ashlyn. A few resources to check out. All right, everybody. Thanks for being with us for today's program. Hope that you enjoyed it. I certainly did. Learned something yeah. new. Uh, and viewers, so that you know, uh, I was checking the schedule. We won't be here next week for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It's a little close to the holiday. So no program next week, but we will be back here on Wednesday, November 30th with a presentation from Colleen Bocan all about owls. Colleen works at Lake Crabtree County Park. So don't miss out on that one. Go ahead and set your calendars. Bookmark the YouTube right here at the museum's YouTube channel uh, and come back and participate again for Owls on November 30th. Uh, until then, everybody, take care. Stay safe out there. Maybe enjoy some good nature and enjoy your holiday break next week. We'll see you again soon. Bye, everybody.